Hello and welcome to the Cattle Show. My name is Mike Jared with Cargill Animal Nutrition and today I'm really excited about the show that we're going to do. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. The topic that we're going to be talking about today is safety on the dairy farm. And really we're going to talk about two different aspects. One is safety that we think of, the people that are working on the farm, but the second is also ties into product safety or food safety. The safety of the milk that we ship off that's ultimately going to be delivered to our consumers that are going to drink dairy products, the milk, and other things. One of the reasons that I mentioned that this topic is pretty near and dear to my heart is just growing up on a dairy operation, myself and others that I've talked to with the same history, most of us can come up with a story of where we maybe got into a situation where it was unsafe or maybe even uh, came close to being injured quite badly from that situation. And I certainly have one of those stories as well. It goes back quite a few years, but uh, it was probably early to mid-December, kind of a cool morning. Things were freezing on the ground. I grew up in a smaller dairy in southern Wisconsin. And we had uh, an area where we pumped manure from the barn up into the storage pit. And typically there was a grate over the top, you know, make sure that no one could, could fall in or anything. But with the freezing weather and everything, the grate had been pulled off. With ice on the ground, it actually happened that I just about slipped and fell into that pit. It's one of those things that sticks with you as you start looking and thinking about safety on the dairy because there are so many places where there are dangers and, and just places where people can be injured badly. When we think about injuries, that certainly comes through in the data that we can look at as well. The National Safety Council has done research uh, back in about 2001 looking at different industries and the number of deaths that can actually occur within that industry per 100,000 workers. Well, agriculture in general is one of the most risky areas that someone can work in, where we have about 22 and a half deaths per 100,000 workers per year. So as you can see, the risk factors that we have on dairy operations or in agriculture in general are quite high. One thing we need to be aware of is that those statistics do not really include uh, children under the age of 16. So that's really another large area that we want to focus on as we start talking about safety in agriculture and on dairies specifically. Because agriculture really is a family-run business in most situations. So there are children around the farms, and those children are at risk in many cases as well. I was just recently made aware of uh, actually three separate incidences where children were killed on operations, and, and it, just, it just pains me to, to hear those things. But we know that it happens, and, and it is a reason that we want to take some time to talk about that. Today we're actually filming in Minnesota and looking at some state statistics here, it is actually not uncommon to find that you can have one injury on about every five farms every year. That could be between 13,000 and 14,000 injuries in this state alone. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. The good news about all of this is that many accidents can be prevented and it really starts with awareness. There's really three key areas that we want to focus on here. Be aware of the high risk areas on your farm, be aware of your surroundings, and be aware of other people when you are working. In the end, what it really comes down to is that safety needs to come from each individual person, being aware of their situation and the things that they're doing. Mike, really appreciate you joining us here today. We were talking a little bit earlier, you know, as I said, many people that I know that grew up on a farm have that story of either themselves or someone else on the operation that may have had a close call. Uh, do you have anything like that in your history? Yeah, I can actually remember the day very vividly. Um, I was on the farm. I was, my, my father raised dairy cows and typical, the old portable grinder mixer. He was grinding feed one day, putting it into the, the feed shed and uh, my brother, a year younger than I was, was out there helping out and uh, there was a chain that came down that would hold the auger stable and the chain started uh, dangling into the hopper where the feed would go into out to the discharge auger. He went to grab the chain to take it out and about that time the chain caught the auger and it sucked his arm right on in and one blade was in his hand, one blade was halfway up the arm, and the next blade was sitting right at his elbow before the chain sheared the shear pin. But, uh, you know, another court of a turn, he'd lost his whole left arm. Well, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons why, you know, we need to be aware of the things that happen. And to be honest, one of the reasons that safety is really important to me is, is really because of the organization that we work for. Uh, safety is just a core element of the business within Cargill Animal Nutrition. Safety has been one of the big things that Cargill continually talks about. It's probably the first thing that our new hires, doing a lot of training of new people that come to the organization, the first thing they hear about is safety. They have to sit down and go through safety videos, talk about safety. They just can't afford to 
let safety think out of their mind for one second because you never know when something's going to happen. Ultimately, what it really comes down to is a belief within the organization that every employee needs to return home safely every night and return the next day to the business safely. So it's not just safety during business hours, but safety at home. And I think that comes through as well. Yeah, everybody of their own personal life, not only with what we do ourselves, but how we interact with our families. It's really important to keep safety on the forefront. Really, this whole thing starts with an awareness that something can be done about safety. It's not just something that happens by chance. If we're looking for situations, if we're uh, aggressively trying to be safe, we can do something about it. What we try to do is we try to look and find uh, opportunities where an accident hadn't occurred, but the potential for an accident would be there to recognize when those potentials happen uh, so that we are more cognizant of it as we do our daily work, that we're looking for those opportunities where an accident could happen. And when we identify those things, we try to record those. And ultimately, that information is used to help identify areas of risk. So if, if it's an area where, where there is a risk that's associated, it's really identifying those things to help us continually remind us about ways that we can be safe. There's so many situations on a farm that until you really start thinking about it, whether it's just getting into a pen of animals, which we do on a daily basis, making sure we know if there's a bull in the area. And if there is, nobody goes into a pen unless they have a spotter to watch for that bull until we can do it. Just things like uh, working in bunker silos, um, looking for the overhangs, looking for the areas. As we start talking about safety, it's, yeah. it's not just the one individual that needs to be thinking about it. it. You know, we still need to be thinking about other people as well. Anytime you're on a farm, watching out uh, if you're operating any kind of equipment, knowing what's going on, and having an idea what, where that piece of equipment's going to go. As much as we try to make sure everybody can go forward, when you're, whether you're driving your vehicle in the yard or when you're around other vehicles, especially as you continue to hire more and more off the farm uh, employees to come out, they may not be as apt about how to back up wagons and uh, tractors and things like that. The more you can have them go forward, the better off it's going to be all the way around. So obviously within our business, safety is very critical. And really, for all of you, I would challenge you to make safety a critical element of your business as well. Please take the time to think more about safety, look for some of those awareness situations, and, and make it a part of your daily operation. By far, one of the largest concerns that we have is with machinery on the farm. There, there can be a lot of things that can happen there. Today's equipment all come with safety equipped right on the device. Things like seat belts and skid steers, horns as they're backing up that go off. Even when I was a kid, you know, it was not, not uncommon at all to ride on the wheel well on the tractor. Now most of the equipment comes with what they call jump seats. For kids, if they were going to ride on the equipment, they could be safety belted right into the jump seats all when it is appropriate for the kids to be riding on the equipment. So it really is designed to have someone there, there's seat belts and other things, because that area, especially of kids or a second individual on a piece of equipment, is one of the largest areas when you look at statistics where injuries and usually big in, uh, injuries or even death can occur. You know, again, uh, you see more and more of the horns and the lights come on as, as equipment's being moved that for sure when it's being backed up, that a horn will go off, letting, know, letting people know that something's be backed up, that they're limited vision on with that piece of equipment as they're backing up. Most of the equipment, if you're not in the seat, it's got a kill switch on it so that the equipment won't be able to be started without actually being in the seat, seat belted in. And there's a reason for that safety equipment to be there, so it's important to make sure that we're making use of those things when they're, yep. when they're already equipped that way. As we start talking about equipment, I mean, certainly there's a lot of danger in just the equipment moving, tractors moving, pulling things, et cetera, where someone could get run over or hit. But there's also obviously a lot of risk when you start dealing with equipment that's running, because if you look at the farm, you know, equipment is designed to mix, to chop, to cut, to do all of these things, and it, it's obviously not compatible with people. So as we start thinking about procedures that we can use to help ensure as we're working on some of those other things, what, what are some things that we could think about to, to try to ensure that you know, someone wouldn't accidentally start up a piece of machinery or, or other things when someone is working on it? 
I know there's been devices put together where if you have to work on a piece of equipment, make sure you take the key out of the ignition so the, the tractor that usually drives it can't be started while you're working on the choppers. Understanding how that piece of equipment works and knowing how to lock that equipment out is really important. Really what we're talking about is uh, you can call it a lockout procedure if you're going to be working on something. Probably one of the second areas uh, that can be most dangerous is, is the risk of suffocation in things like bins and, and other things. As we start talking about entry to bins or bunkers now today with feed storage and others, what are some of the things that we look at to, to try to ensure that uh, our people and the people on farm are safe? Anytime you go into a bunker, our standard rule is for every foot high the face of that bunker is, you stay two feet away from that bunker face. So when we go to take samples, things like that, we try to encourage our people to have somebody go in and get a sample with a bucket or something for us that they can bring it away from the face of that bunker and be able to take that sample from that bucket there so we don't have to worry about getting in front of the face of that. Obviously sampling is, is another aspect of that. It's not just safety because we can get a much better quality sample when we have that producer go up and shave the face and actually pull that back so that we're not just sampling you know, in a range from two feet to six feet that we can reach, but we're actually getting a good sample up and down the entire bunker face. Operate silos is another real big one. Every year you hear about somebody going in, especially this time of the year as they're putting in new forages, or whether it's haylage or in the fall corn silage, and then they have to cover it, uh, readjust some of the uh, unloading equipment, and being overwhelmed by the gases that are being produced through fermentation and being suffocated. You have gas fumes in silos with unloaders, but uh, once again, it's a piece of equipment where that lockout procedure that we talked about can be very important. Another area, you know, maybe we don't spend a lot of time entering bins themselves, but grain bins and things like that with suffocation. But a lot of times when they have on the farm grain that they're feeding along with it, again, when they're harvesting those in the fall, or even when they're unloading some of that, you hear about it all the time that uh, an individual crawls up there to uh, clean something out or whatever. The piece of equipment gets kicked down and, and it doesn't take very long and they'll get sucked right into the grain and uh, again you can suffocate fairly easily in that. Are, are there some other areas that you think would be valuable for people to, to think about uh, just in the local community as well? Are there other resources and things that they can use? Some of the things that we're doing right now is as we're doing on the farm safety walkthroughs with our producers from uh, some of our production people, one of the things that some of them have been suggested to do is contact their local fire department, police department, uh, rescue squad, and just give them a tour of the farm so they have an idea of where the electrical shutoff switches are, where the different hazard areas could be, just different things that could be useful for the rescue squad as well as the fire department, things like that. Certainly another risk area uh, as we start dealing with the farm is the animals. Yeah, in this situation, in this farm, most of the cows themselves are all bred artificially, but the heifers are all done with a, a, a bull. And uh, one of those things, I don't care if it's with the bull or with even the cows themselves, Try not to turn your back to the, to the animals. Try to keep them in front of you. Try to walk slow, not to alarm them. We all know when cows are in heat, they get more aggressive. So yeah, and understanding what's going on in the operation. The other thing is that anytime you go into a pen with animals, always have an access exit route planned out ahead of time. Just so that if a surprise does happen, you know how to exit that pen very quickly if you need to. With the bull here, the producers actually have some some requirements that they have in, in dealing with that pen. The biggest thing there is when they need to start moving those animals out of that pen as they get closer to calving. You never work those cattle by yourself. You always have a minimum of two people and a lot of times they like to have one of the skid steers in there again just to have a, an exit route to get around that bull. You hope you never have to use it but uh, these bulls can be pretty aggressive once in a while. As we talked a little bit on, on the introduction, I mean, a big concern that we have as well is, is children on the dairy. It's not uncommon at all that we see kids as early as the early teens driving big equipment and doing a lot of things as the hired hand on the operations. So really what it comes down to is taking the time to check, first of all, that they understand what some of the risks are, take the time to actually talk about it. And always remember, as an old supervisor told me, always inspect what you expect. 
one very good resource that's out there, uh, especially for kids, is, is an organization called Farm Safety for Kids, because they have a, just a number of different resources on the site, as well as uh, local meetings and other things, really focused on ways that we can make the farm and, and agriculture much more safe for the children that are, that are involved with this industry. We've talked quite a bit about personal safety on the farm, but there's really another aspect of safety that I want to make sure that we touch base on as well, and, and that's really the whole aspect around food quality. What are maybe some of the things that you see that we're focused on to really help us make sure and ensure that we have the best quality inputs to the cows so that we have a good quality milk output? It starts with the ingredients that we're buying, Mike. Every ingredient's checked on arrival. Uh, we do on-site on different checks. We want to make sure we're delivering a quality product. Milk from these cows today could be made into ice cream by tomorrow. So we have to know from a quality assurance standpoint, our plants, minimum of a daily basis, and we're even getting from a shift standpoint, will go through and they'll track things like trace minerals, vitamins, that uh, if by chance there was a mistake made on something, it's caught immediately. Most of the time, if anything ever happens, it's caught before that product even leaves the plant. If it does, we've got recall procedures in place that uh, it can be tracked down within a few hours if needs to be. So much of that can even come back to, to tracking back you know, what was hauled prior to that ingredient being hauled on the truck to ensure that there's not a contamination issue actually testing that ingredient when it gets into the plant for quality measures and, and other things to ensure that it's a high quality ingredient as well. Yeah, all of our feeds here, you can call back at any time. We have retained samples of every product we make there. Uh, they also have records that they, like you said, they can go through what was mixed in the mixer before and after your feed, what was put through the pellet mill before and after your feed, and like you said, what was hauled on the trucks before and after the load of feed that you've got. One of the things that we're working on right now is uh, something called HACCP certification, uh, hazard analysis and critical control points. Making sure that we uh, are tracking all of these items that are critical to a good quality manufacturing. Really, it comes out of the, the human food industry to ensure that product quality you know, meets human grade standards and things. You know, the key point here is that it's not something that we're required to do. I mean, we, we obviously have to meet minimum requirements within the industry, uh, you know, from various organizations, et cetera, and, and from government regulations. But we want to make sure that we're setting the standard and really raising the bar on what's required on everything that we're doing. And that's really where this whole HACCP program is coming into play. Yeah, a prime example of that is FDA has required us to any medications that we track that on a daily basis. Cargill not only tracks that, but they've went to the trace minerals, the vitamins, that's all tracked on a daily basis right along with what FDA requires. So we, we've always felt we have to go over and above to assure that we're delivering a quality product to our producers and ultimately to the consumers out there that will use our producers' products. You know, we've talked quite a bit about how uh, it's very important to have happy, stress-free cows, you know, animals that are in a well-designed facility and other things, uh, just to ensure that we have a safe animal and a productive animal. But another element really comes into the quality of the milk they produce as well. So when we start looking around, what are some of the things that we look at that can have an impact on milk quality when we deal with the animal environment and the way that they're handled? Well, sanitation is a big part of that and how well they uh, in the parlor situations, wash down, making sure all the equipment's uh, checked on a regular basis so that we can minimize any bacteria issues that, that can arise in it. Another element that we want to think about when we start talking about that foundation being you know, healthy cows really comes into how we handle animals and preventing disease and other things from occurring as well. And, and really, we start that with good biosecurity procedures on farm. This herd here is a closed herd. What I mean by a closed herd, uh, the heifers that are used as replacements are grown on the operation. As operations are getting larger that they're having to buy animals from another site, having an isolation spot, trying to get them there before they're actually going to be coming, getting into the milking herd, so you can isolate those animals for a time period. I'd recommend doing some blood checks uh, just to see what kind of uh, pathogens or what kind of diseases that you know, they may be having different titer levels for versus other animals that you have on the farm. 
Uh, again, making sure those animals get vaccinated appropriately for based off the protocol that you've got on the farm. I mean, one of the things we try to work with all our producers on is having a procedure manual. Again, that can be done the same way every day with all the animals. When we start talking about disease and, and potentially bringing it into the farm, bringing a new animal in is one way, but another is really the people that may come in and interact yeah. with that operation as well. So when we talk biosecurity, we have to be concerned about visitors to the farm. First thing when I, when we hire a new consultant that I start working with, the first thing that I have them do is I have them go down to their local animal health store or whatever. They're gonna need a bucket, they're gonna need a scrub brush, and they're gonna need disinfectant because I, I don't want them going on to a farm without disinfecting their boots is the first thing that they do, and then also the last thing they do. Obviously another element of a healthy animal is going to be the diet and the nutrients that she consumes as well, making sure that things are balanced correctly. What are some of the key elements that we want to look at there? We always talk about there's three different types of diets. There's the diet that I put together on paper, there's the diet that gets mixed in the TMR mixers, and actually the diet that gets uh, the cows actually eat themselves. So we're going to go through and do a lot of things as far as measuring the physical appearance of the uh, feedstuffs themselves trying to monitor how the cows are eating the feed, whether it's the, if they're sorting the feed or not. Water, I mean, everybody talks about all the nutrients that we feed a cow today. The number one nutrient that that cow consumes on a daily basis is water. We can talk all we want about the nutrients we're feeding them, but if they're not drinking water, I'll guarantee you they're not gonna eat the feed either. So uh, all those things go into effect and have an, uh, a big effect on what goes on with that cow on a daily basis. Another key element when we start talking about feeding and nutrition of the cattle, it, it really is important that you understand the suppliers of those ingredients that are going to go into your diet. Uh, you know, making sure that uh, you know, you, you've got quality ingredients coming in as the base. It starts with forage quality, but there's so many other ingredients as well. You know the stuff that you're getting from a manufacturer such as Cargill is of the utmost quality, but there's a lot of producers, especially as they get larger, that are bringing commodities on the farms themselves. Making sure that they're buying in those things from a reputable standpoint. Again, getting down to those procedures and protocols and going through it with your feed supplier of, if you bring off the farm ingredients in, making sure that they understand what those are procedures and protocols are and what the expectations are for those things and sending in samples on a regular basis, not only of your forages, but also the other ingredients that you're bringing. If you go in any manufacturing facility uh, in your local town and ask them for a procedures manual, most all of them will give you a manual that goes through every procedure. These farms are just like any other manufacturing facility. We're manufacturing milk here. Uh, and sitting down with your professionals that you work with, whether it's a veterinarian, your feed supplier, and developing those procedures, I think is a really important part of what producers today can do to assure the consumer that they're putting a quality product together. When, when we start talking about uh, product safety being uh, the milk side, uh, another key element uh, is really the harvesting of that or the milking procedures that take place. What are some of the things that producers you know, really need to be focused on there to ensure that they're, they're harvesting that milk in a good way as well? There's a lot of good milking equipment type professionals that understand this equipment. Again, having those procedures and protocols on how often your milking equipment gets checked, how often the different pieces that need to be replaced on a regular basis are being replaced. Uh, but then also when it comes to washing down the parlors, I mean, having again that protocol on what happens, when it happens. You start from the top and wash down so that everything gets washed after each milking in those parlors. We also need to be concerned about how the animals are prepared themselves as well. Again, there's a set procedure. The most important part of that is consistency. That it's done every time the same way that those animals, as they're going into those parlors, whether it's how you do your pre-dips, your post-dips, uh, the type of things you use, that needs to be consistent. It's interesting how consistency keeps coming up and procedures and the way we do things and the way we handle animals. And a lot of that comes down to having policies in place so that we do have a way to transfer that, especially in farms where multiple people are doing some of these jobs. So now we've kind of gotten to the point where we've got the milk harvested correctly. 
And now, now we're getting to that point where it needs to be stored and, and handled correctly from there. What, what are some of the key things that we need to think about to ensure that we maintain that milk quality now that we've harvested it from the cows? Again, as you harvest it from the cows, you're going to be putting it into a stainless steel tank that's collected on a daily basis by your local milk hauler. That milk has to be cooled down. So all the dairies have cooling plates. Cool water as it goes through these cooling plates will cool the milk down. The milk haulers will come and pick the milk up and haul it down. And then all that equipment has to be cleaned out between each pickup. Always keep at the top of your mind that the milk you produce will be consumed as a dairy product. Quality and safety are a must. Well, we've run out of time on another edition of The Cattle Show. I'd like to thank you for joining us today on this very important topic of safety. We've spent a lot of time talking about safety, but really we've only started to scratch the surface of this whole area. So once again, I would challenge you to really spend some time to think about the safety that you employ on your dairy, the people that are working there, the situations, and just be aware of, of what's going on. For The Cattle Show, this is Mike Jarrett with Cargill Animal Nutrition. If you have a product or service that you'd like to see featured on a future program, or if you have questions or comments, please contact us.